Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 320, I chat with James Nyhaus, the cinematographer on IMAX's A Beautiful Planet, about shooting that movie from the International Space Station. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for home theater geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded September 8th, 2016, episode 320 IMAX in Space. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all in one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is James Nyhaus, a cinematographer who has worked on a number of IMAX films as well as some other projects. James, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, Scott. Glad, glad to be here. It's, I'm so uh, glad to have you here. We got all kinds of interesting things to talk about. And uh, before we do, though, I want to make sure that everybody knows those who are watching live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv and uh, post questions for James as we go. And I'll pass along as many as I can. Uh, it really helps if you put my screen name in your message, which is my name, Scott Wilkinson, no dots or dashes. Uh, because that way it shows up in a different color on my screen and my eye will be more easily drawn to it. And how appropriate that this particular episode of Home Theater Geeks is being recorded today, September 8th, 2016, exactly 50 years after the first episode of Star Trek. The original series was aired on September 8th, 1966. Um, and the reason why it's so appropriate for today's show will become evident very quickly. Uh, but James, I'll start by asking you, uh, did you watch the original Star Trek when it was first aired? Oh, oh yeah, I was, I was a Trekkie for sure. I'd, I'd get home from school and get my homework done. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Right. Nudge, nudge, <laughs> wink, wink, wink. Know what I mean? Say no more. Know what I mean? Say no more. Uh, so I could watch <laughs> Star Trek. Um, yeah, I love the show. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I did too. I did too. And I've been a lifelong Trekkie ever since. Yeah. Or Trekker, depending. You know, some people uh, object to the term Trekkie, but I don't. I think it's fine. I don't care. I uh, uh, I was got to meet uh, George Takei a few weeks ago. So that was no a real kidding. Trip. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. What no, were the uh, circumstances of that? Uh, we were at uh, a celebration for the Apollo 11 anniversary uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center uh, that um, Buzz Aldrin was doing. And ah. uh, George and his husband were uh, were guests of honor. And, and uh, I think George was the, the main keynote speaker. So uh, great but, guys. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? What a television yeah. show from 50 years ago. It's still going. It's still going. And it still has an impact on our culture and our society. Yeah. Um, and how many people did it inspire to oh, become it, astronauts or physicists or scientists of, of one sort or another? I mean, it, it's remarkable. Knows. I mean, it's it's crazy what what uh, what films can do. Uh, we've had several astronauts I know for sure that have that have become astronauts after seeing our uh, IMAX movies. So mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure there there were several uh, Trekkie astronauts. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti was the Italian astronaut uh, on IMAX on the uh, International Space Station while we were making uh, A Beautiful Planet. And mm -hmm. she was she had a, a picture of herself in her Trekkie outfit in space. So, oh, yeah, she wow. Space. Did she bring yeah. her outfit to space and actually wear it at the space station? She brought it. She brought it to space and, and wore it in space. Uh, it's pretty wow. cool. Wow. That is so cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, listen, before we get into A Beautiful Planet, which is one of the major things I want to talk about today, 
Uh, I'd love to get your impression on a few sort of more general topics. Uh, for example, uh, shooting digital digital photography versus film, actual film. Mm -hmm. uh, IMAX is famous for film, right? They they use this Absolutely. large format film, 70 millimeter film. Most film is 35 millimeter for the movies. Right. IMAX is twice that size. Um, but And I imagine you probably shot both digitally and with film. What, what are your feelings about the differences and which do you prefer, that sort of thing? Well, I'm, I'm actually a film person. I like, I like to, to, to shoot film, but each, each of the formats has its place. Um, you know, it's, it's an art form, and both, both formats are mediums for that art form, uh, filmmaking. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, each one has, has a place. Uh, we shot mostly digital um, for uh, a beautiful planet. Uh, we mm -hmm. couldn't fly film in space because we don't have a space shuttle to bring it back. So we had to shoot digital. So it was all sent down by the pipeline, you know, a little internet thing and, uh, we did it that way. And we couldn't have done it without, without a digital camera because we couldn't get any film back from space. Mm -hmm. uh, the digital cameras yeah. also gave us a look at things we'd never seen before, like cities at night and, and, uh, because the high sensitivity and the high dynamic range of the, of the, of the, uh, digital sensors. Hmm. Uh, now, other earlier IMAX movies in space had been shot on film, but I guess because we had the shuttle, we could bring that film right. back. Right. Right. It, you know, you look at, at three minutes of IMAX footage weighs 10 pounds. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, you know, 10 pounds of digital media will hold hundreds of terabytes of information. So yeah. uh, we shot 11 and a half terabytes on a beautiful planet. So, they, you know, it would have been a lot of of, of of pounds of film coming back from space. Uh, uh, so it, NASA, that's the first thing they told us when we said we wanted to make this movie was that, well, you can't fly film, so what are you going to do? Mm, mm. Not, not to mention the fact that, what does it cost, a million dollars per pound or per ounce or whatever it is to, to fly something into space? It's tremendously expensive. It's, it's, it's expensive. I think it's like $10,000 a pound or something like that for the shuttle. Okay. I don't know what, uh, you know, things like SpaceX or Orbital these days, uh, what their fees are, but I'm sure it's still quite a, quite a bit per pound to get to, to orbit. So, uh, you know, and you know, the, the digital, the digital images gave, or the digital imaging systems gave us the ability to get, uh, you know, much more detailed, uh, record of of uh life on board the space station uh that we'd never gotten before because when you're limited to three minutes a roll you're very very conservative with what you shoot with digital you're able to take chances to reshoot things uh you know back up and rewind <laughs> uh, yeah, right <laughs> oops didn't mean to do that so let's just uh, erase that part and do it yeah. again yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so what are the so what are the advantages of film what what would you have preferred to use film in the, uh, in the case of a beautiful planet for example i i would have preferred to have have some of the some of the shots in uh in film uh the daylight passes over the earth uh the resolution that that an IMAX frame, uh, you said it's twice as big as the 35. It's actually 10 times as big as the 35 frame. Uh, hmm. So it gives you that much more resolution. We, we shot at a 4K resolution uh, with the Canon cameras that we used. Uh, and but, you know, an IMAX frame is probably 12K or 16K in resolution. So we're, we're still short of, of that native resolution that the IMAX frames are used to seeing, IMAX fans are used to seeing. So the digital stuff, uh, it's not quite there resolution-wise, but there, it makes up for, for what it lacks in resolution and a lot of other factors. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it would have been a good, a, a good hybrid film. Right. Are you a fan of film grain? Would you use that as an artistic element? A lot of people talk about, oh, well, you know, film grain, you don't get that in digital. Right. Uh, it's, it's one of, it's one of the, uh, the, the uh, characters of film. It, it's, it's part of what makes it different than digital. You know, when you shoot on a digital frame, every pixel is in the same place at every, every frame. You know, that pixel is going to be right there at this frame and the next 2,000 frames. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with film, that grain moves around. It gives an organic feel that, you, that is very hard to replicate in digital. Uh, and that I think I, I always had this, this, uh, this quote that, uh, you know, emulsion equals emotion. And, <laughs> uh, wow, that's good. I like it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think there, in, in the history of art, we have never thrown out a medium. 
you know, we still paint in oils. Artists still paint in oils. They still paint in charcoal. Uh, all these these mediums that were used centuries ago are still very viable. Why why is an art form would we ever think about throwing a medium away? Well, that's uh, a very good and, point. Yeah. And that's that's why that's why I, I love film. It just it has a so much different feel uh, on the screen than, than digital. They each have their place, but mm -hmm. I think, I think, you know, if you're looking for a different medium, a different look, a different feel, film gives you something that you cannot get digitally. Uh, user 1037 is asking, what was it that was so heavy? The cameras I, 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 with film, I think it's the film with, with film. It's film. IMAX film for a thousand feet of film, which goes through the camera in three minutes. It weighs 10 pounds and you know, it's, it's the size of a, of a medium sized pizza it uh, takes up quite a bit of space, and you know, mm -hmm. whereas a uh, 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 you know a digital you know drive that we were recording on is about the size of a of a phone, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's a big difference. You get th thirty thirty minutes of footage on this, and three minutes of footage on something that size that weighs ten pounds. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's certainly less efficient in that regard. It's a lot less efficient, and and the camera, the noise the camera makes is kind of like a pissed off sewing machine. Uh, <laughs> well, that's another problem. <laughs> that's another problem. You don't really get good audio with it. <laughs> right. Well, in fact, uh, this is this user 1037, whose name is uh, Hamid, also asks, uh, it, what about the difference in audio? Uh, he's blind, that's so he doesn't know if digital audio sounds crisper, cleaner, more real. Um it, it took a while for everybody to come around to digital audio. I think uh, years ago I was I was I recorded a, a film mixed a film at Skywalker Sound, and they were still using the two inch you know magnetic tape. Mm -hmm. uh, they said because we just don't like the way the digital system sounds. But now I think it's it's again it's it's that digital versus analog thing. Uh, I think there's still a richness in digit in analog re audio recording that that you don't get with with uh, with digital i think it's digital is too perfect i think that i think we like mm -hmm. some of the imperfections in there at least we've grown up liking them and right. i think maybe as as generations don't hear them it will probably fade from memory but uh yeah yeah uh, <clears throat> emily the strange is asking uh how and what are the differences in technology they used for that for the movie blue planet from national geographic i don't did you work on that one i don't know if you did well, we, we did a film years ago, uh, uh, released in 1990, uh, called Blue Planet. It was an IMAX movie. Uh, hmm. Shortly thereafter, uh, BBC released their series called Blue Planet. So there was some mix-up between whose was whose. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, but there was an IMAX movie called uh, Blue Planet. It was all shot on film in space by the astronauts, uh, which a beautiful planet was actually sort of... we intended it to be a follow-on to Blue Planet, sort of another a sequel, look at in a sequel 25 years later, you know. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> um, so OSX05949 asks, how long did it take to download all that data? And another another right. way to state that question is, what is the bandwidth that you right. that you get from the space station? Uh, I believe the bandwidth that we got, the standard bandwidth, was 300 megabits a second, uh, something like that. It took quite a while because we're not the only user. Uh, you know, they just don't shut the space station down and say, okay, IMAX is downloading their footage. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, you can't just sort of say, forget it. Sorry, yeah, can't sorry, do anything else. Sorry, scientists all over the world, you're screwed because the IMAX is loading. <laughs> no. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Um, we had... Uh, like I say, 11 and a half terabytes, uh, it came down over a 15 month period. So, uh, you know, it didn't take that long to do it, obviously. Um, one, we, we ran into an issue where we, we had to download a bunch of 4k footage that we didn't expect to do and had to do a workaround for it. And it took us six weeks to get a gig and a half down, mm -hmm. uh, not a gig, a, a terabyte and a half down. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, but that was off and on, off and on. But, uh, <coughs> now, it, a beautiful it was, Sorry, go ahead. No, it was not. It was not an inconsequential thing to have to do to download all that that footage from space. But uh, yeah, no kidding. NASA <laughs> NASA helped us out, and uh, they did a great job. The astronauts did a great job. So, um, I believe a beautiful planet and some of your other work with IMAX uh, were in 3D. Did you shoot native in 3D, or was it post processed? 
for for this film for a beautiful planet we shot uh 2d and post-processed uh did the conversions the 3d did, did dimensionalization uh in post uh, uh in toronto and uh but because we we really couldn't fly a 3d rig uh in space with a beam splitter and all sorts of fun things like that mm-hmm. um we for uh space station we uh custom built an imax film camera that was a double lens side-by-side camera that shot two frames stereo side-by-side side at the same time uh and now our 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 30 our three minutes of film now just became a minute and a half of film <laughs> and, oh man and, Oh yeah, don't, don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, that's what we did for for Space Station. But for this film, we did actually do the the post conversion. Legend three D in uh, in Toronto did a great job doing that for us. Mm-hmm. What is your feeling generally about three D movies? Um, um, so I'm not a fan a, a of three co- D movies. <laughs> You're not a fan. I'm okay. really not a fan of my last my last five IMAX movies have been three D, but. Um, I, you know, it's, it's fun to do. It's, I, I like doing it. I like watching them, but it's, it can be a real pain. And unless you're, you're got a good story, a good space, no pun intended, uh, yeah. to work with in 3d, it, I, I think you just have to, you force it too much. Um, uh, you know, some of the Hollywood films that are made that come out on 3d, I don't think, I think it's just, you know, a waste of time and mm-hmm. effort. And more, more gimmicky than, than more gimmicky really than useful. anything. You know, it's mm-hmm. it works best. 3D works best on a big screen. That's why IMAX 3D films work so well. It's because of the yeah. giant giant screen, and uh, uh, you just don't get that with the smaller smaller screens. Right, which is probably one primary reason why 3D TVs have kind of gone away. On a way, yeah, they, they yeah, came what, and they went. They came that, and they were big for a little that, while, and now they're gone. But 3D that, in the commercial cinema is still going strong. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it is, and 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 it's it's partially the the studios see another revenue point for it, uh, which you know is good. Uh, I wish they'd kind sure. of maybe pass along some of that extra money to the filmmakers occasionally. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> you know, th- this whole this whole move to digital uh, was was you know a great thing for the for the studios because they don't have to ship prints, they don't have to make prints, you know, so they're saving millions and billions of dollars, but they're sure yeah, not yeah, passing. Yeah. Us, yeah, us movie yeah. goers. <laughs> yeah, doggone it. Um, <laughs> what about HDR, high dynamic range? Um, high dynamic range, yep. Yeah, la- uh, IMAX has recently started installing laser illuminated projectors in some of their theaters, uh, which do achieve a higher dynamic range, a wider dynamic range than uh, film or, or conventional digital projectors with a lamp. Um yeah. They're not the IMAX laser projectors, if I'm not mistaken, aren't quite as high dynamic range as, say, Dolby Vision, which gets to 31 foot Lamberts on the screen, whereas IMAX, I think, gets to 22. Yeah, um, I think I, something like that. I don't know exactly the numbers. I've seen both systems, and yeah. uh, uh, Dolby is not really going to the same size screen that IMAX is going to either. Well, uh, that's true. That's also yeah, true. You know, the, the distance is a, is a factor. Yeah. Uh, but are are you a, an HDR fan? Did you shoot a beautiful planet in in HDR essentially? We we uh, didn't specifically shoot it in HDR. Uh, the the Canon cameras we use, the C five hundred, the one DC, uh, all have a great dynamic range to begin with. Uh, so we we really didn't specifically shoot for an HDR. We we knew that that. Uh, the 4K laser system was coming from IMAX. We we previewed a lot of things in it, and we saw that that the digital system we would picked uh, was going to work well uh, with with that that laser 4K. So that that really made us happy, and I, I think it's the best way these days to see a film is is laser laser projection, you know, 4K. Mm-hmm. I would agree with you completely. Yeah. Is that one of the advantages of digital that you can, in fact? capture a higher dynamic range than than film even IMAX film or or does IMAX film capture that same kind of range well uh film is typically film whether it's 35 or IMAX it all comes off the same big sheet in in Rochester um and dynamic range on film is 15 16 stops uh so that's pretty much what uh you know what we're looking at with high dynamic range these days. Sure, it's, sure, yeah. I didn't realize that film was that big, that that high a dynamic range natively. 
it's always been there. We've just reduced it so much uh, in projection technology. Uh, it's the it's the laser technology that's allowing us to get back to the sort of uh, dynamic range that was that film was actually capable of to begin with. Uh, of course, once you go through the chain of interpositive, internegative prints, uh, you know that drops down. Uh, you don't mm, see true. that loss with with digital. So mm. uh, uh, yeah, digital is is better for dynamic range that way. Once you're getting through the whole workflow chain production chain yeah production right. chain uh, and uh, you know with 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 displays now they're just catching up with with you've got to have an hdr display to watch an hdr image yep yep uh, absolutely if your display won't handle it then what's the point um right so now we're we're having these 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 high dynamic range displays that are that are just absolutely beautiful and um yeah, so, really yeah I, right. I, I I love the way it looks when it's done right. When it's done wrong, I you know I'm I'm not some big a fan of it. But uh, <laughs> okay, the high dynamic range, uh, it, you can push it too far. I see, I see still images uh, that photographers use and do, and and sometimes I think they just go too far and it looks hyper real, and mm. I, that I don't like. I don't care for it at all. Well, speaking of hyper real, that brings up the the other sort of general question I wanted to ask you, which is high frame rate. High frame rate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, that is now becoming something to talk about. And clearly, if you did that in, in IMAX film, your three minutes per reel would, would drop down dramatically as well. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Well, um, we, did, we did that. We did that uh, back in, in the 90s. We would, uh, oh, yeah? IMAX did a 48 frame. They called it uh, IMAX HD. This was before HD came out. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a 48 frame per second system. And it's it's great. I mean, it, it works very well. Again, you're back your thousand feet of film instead of being three minutes is now a minute and a half. Right. Uh, Kodak loved it, you know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm sure they did. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but what about the what about the complaint that it's that it's hyper real, that it's quote unquote real. too yeah. real? I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we've gotten used to seeing a bit of motion blur blurring in, in our, our movie picture, moving picture images that that isn't there with the higher dynamic or higher frame rate images. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's part of it. Uh, it's yeah. Again, it's it's just it's too real. It's it's like 4K these days it, when you shoot a dramatic film uh, in 4K. Uh, a lot of cinematographers are, are dumbing that system down with the actresses because, you know, a, a friend of mine from Canon said, you know, you can't shoot a 70 year old sex symbol with with 4K. It just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she it looks, looks like you very real. much. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, this was the same uh, complaint I heard from, for example, news anchors when when we first transitioned from standard def to high def. Yeah. You know, and they also complained of, man, you can see my makeup. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where the the airbrush and the airbrush makeup came in, and 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 you really, when you once you hit high def enough, we're we're pushing on to ultra high def with 6K and 8K. Uh, all those little things, you know, the the stitches in the in the costumings will will mm -hmm. come into play, and and all the little small details in in makeup will be a big deal. Details and big big issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. Have you seen? Um did you see The Hobbit, for example, Peter Jackson's movie that he shot in 3D with two cameras uh, and at 48 frames per second? Yeah, I, I, I saw that, and unfortunately, I slept through the last half of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a Hobbit fan, but... Uh, and you're a sorry, Hobbit fan. Okay, sorry, well... Peter, I, it just... I, uh, no, and I, I never really even... I finally watched the other two uh, uh, of the of the trilogy part, the whatever it is, the... the yeah. Three, three, the Hobbit, three of yeah. the three Hobbit films. I finally watched the other two on, on television, but uh, I didn't see them in the theaters. <laughs> Did you happen to see, have you seen anything of Ang Lee's upcoming film, um, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, which he shot at 120 frames a second? Right, right. I have not seen anything of that. A, a, a friend of mine, good friend of mine, John Toll, ASC, was, was uh, the DP on it, and I talked to him a bit after right after they shot it and he thought it was an interesting process uh but the 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 folks that i have i have talked with who who have seen bits and pieces of it have not been that that glowing a review about it so i mm. think it's the same sort of uh hyper realism 
for realism. Yeah. I, I look yeah. forward to seeing it, though. I mean, I love Ang Lee films. Oh, yeah. I saw the 10-minute clip at NAB last April, yeah. and um, I, I thought it looked pretty stunning myself. I, I, I don't share what most people, in fact, say about it being too, too real, hyper real. I, I was quite blown away by it. The problem is <laughs> there are, no commercial cinema today can show it at 120 frames at 4K in 3D. Right. That's a, that's a lot of data. I mean, it, it's it a lot of data. <laughs> Uh, I forget what film it was. Uh, oh shoot, is a 3D version of, of it may be in the 3D version of Titanic when it came out. Uh, it took them seven or eight hours to to load it into the server. Uh, I can imagine yeah. something that's at at you know 120 frames 3D 4K. <laughs> it's going to take you a week just to get it in the bloody box and hope yeah, it doesn't yeah. crash. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk more about A Beautiful Planet, and I've got some pictures to show you that are really, really cool. But before we do, I'd like to thank one of our sponsors for this episode, which is Epson. Now, Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank, earning it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. So you'll have no more out-of-ink frustration. It includes up to two years of ink, equal to 11,000 black pages, or 8,500 color pages, right there, ready to go. You can save up to 80% on ink with low-cost replacement ink bottles. Also, it's powered by Precision Core printing technology. It has auto two-sided printing and a 30-page auto document feeder and easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's EcoTank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. In fact, the Epson EcoTank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. So visit epson.com slash ecotank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson EcoTank printers. That's E-P-S-O-N dot com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson very much for their support of home theater geeks. Epson, exceed your vision. <clears throat> okay, now it's time to turn to your latest movie, which has uh, now been out in some IMAX theaters for a little while. I can't wait to see it in uh, at the California Science Center here in L.A. where I live. Um, but they're currently undergoing the process of converting to laser projection, laser illuminated projection. So I'm happy to wait for that because I think it's going to be astonishing. I love laser illuminated projection. Um, so let's talk about the process of making this movie called A Beautiful Planet. I imagine, uh, well, one of the first steps was training the astronauts. And we've got a yep. few pictures uh, of that to show people. Yep, training the astronauts uh, uh, was part of my job. I, I tell everybody I'm the only DP in the world that has to train his his first unit how to make a movie. Uh, <laughs> this is so, uh, was Barry Wilmore working with us uh, at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, Butch was our very first uh, crew member. He got it out of the box and got to use it first. So uh, he got some amazing images for us. That's Tony Myers, the director in the background. The um, director of the movie, you mean? The movie, yeah. Yeah, and, okay. and and me there with my mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if we go to the next one, uh, here's you with another of the astronauts. Right, that's that's Scott Kelly. Scott's been a year up in space. Uh, he uh, uh, Oh, he was that guy. Was that guy, yeah, that, that guy. So uh, uh, Scott uh, shot some of the stuff for us. Uh, he, he's featured in the movie, and uh, uh, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He got, uh, got some, some interesting images. I found it uh, interesting. I saw that um, I've been reading uh, Chris Hadwell's book, uh, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. Yeah. And he talks about his training as an astronaut and how he had to train to become a geologist or some other uh, professions. And he had to sort of be good enough. But they, that's much easier, much better to do than training a top flight geologist, for example, to be an astronaut. 
So Very you're doing a, some, something like that here. You're training these astronauts to be uh, cinematographers, filmmakers. filmmakers yeah, yeah. They're uh, te technically they're they're great. I mean, they pick up things really quick. It's the uh, uh, the aesthetics of filmmaking that usually uh, uh, takes a little bit longer. Uh, but once they shoot something and we go and show it to them on an IMAX screen, they they get the idea of how it works and and uh, uh, they're quick learners. Um, and yeah, once I'm they, sure that's once true. they <clears throat> once they decide they're going to do something, uh, they do it right. And uh, so we've never had uh, any issues. Uh, I've trained 150, I think, crew for 22 or 23 space shuttle flights. And wow, so. wow. Uh, now this these two pictures are are in a conference room. I guess you're sort of right. familiarizing them with the cameras. Next couple of shots are, I believe, in simulators. Right. That's in one of the simulators. That's one of the. Uh, 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 space station simulators at the Johnson uh, Space Center. Uh, we take them in there and just to make them, you know, get used to working in the in the area, the the confines they will be in on orbit, uh, and uh, let them shoot shoot uh, film or shoot uh, uh, digital now. And uh, like I said, we take them and uh, take what they shot and and put them in a theater and let them uh, see it up on the big screen. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the groups came in with. Uh, complete with a uh, uh, storyboard and uh, a script and props to shoot their, <laughs> their <laughs> test. So, wow. um, uh, I now said, what? okay, well, these guys will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, this uh, this picture I thought was pretty interesting. It's you and Scott, I guess, uh, I, working working with someone, a model there in the simulator. That's, actually, that's Scott's girlfriend, and she, oh. she worked <laughs> the public affairs office at, uh, at, uh, Johnson. So she, okay. she came in to be, uh, to be, uh, our actress for the day. Uh, -huh. she looks a little nervous to me in that a little photograph. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, so tell us the cameras that, that are, that we see in these photos and that you used in the shoot. Okay. Uh, well, this one is, uh, the Canon C500 It's a 4k, uh, imaging system. Uh, we use Canon zoom lenses as well as a uh, Airy Master Prime uh, 12 mil uh, zoom, uh, 12 mil uh, prime. Uh, we recorded onto the Codex uh, 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 onboard S recorder. You see it there. Uh, the little gray things above the IMAX name uh, inside the machine there is the data pack, and uh, uh, that's uh, you know a half a terabyte of of material in that little package, and that's what came back to uh, to Earth to uh, uh, offload and then to make our uh, our film from. So everything uh, that we shot uh, inside the uh, uh, station was done with this camera. Uh, it, it's at a, a 16:9 aspect ratio, and we didn't we didn't blow it up to the full 143 aspect ratio of um, the IMAX screens just because it wouldn't, we didn't feel that we needed to. And we were real, real as worried about cutting the sides off the thing and blowing it up. So we basically sort of letter boxed it in. Nobody really notices it. Uh, but uh, that's what mm. we did with the camera. And uh, Creamy Corncob in the chat room is asking what in the world does such a camera cost? Uh, well, you know, that's, that's a, a good question. Uh, probably that, outfit you were looking at there is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of I don't know, $30,000, $40,000, something like that. Including the the recorder, the d storage, and so on? Recorder, the storage, uh, the camera, the lens, uh, not counting the tripod because that's a zero, that's a 1G thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, once you train these guys, uh, they go up in space, and, and we ha I have a few pictures of sort of life on the International Space Station, or ISS, that I'd love to show people. Uh, here, for example, this, is an astronaut doing the Superman thing. Superman. That's uh, that's the Japanese astronaut uh, Koichi, uh, not Koichi, uh, uh, Kimia Yui. Uh, and uh, he was a great guy. He was one of our operators. And uh, they, they got this great picture of him doing the Superman fly through the station. It's, <laughs> it's one of the things they do to pass time is, is they see how far they can fly without, you know, make it through the hatch without crashing into things. And, and uh <laughs> Uh, yeah. And everybody, everybody asked me, why, why do we have all the IMAX stickers all over everything? Well, I see it's because we can find the stuff whenever that gets lost. It looks see, pretty cluttered in there. It's a little, it's a little cluttered and this is on a neat day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> 
there's another picture of him playing with fruit, which I thought fruit, was really yeah. hilarious. Yeah, this is this is actually a shot like this is in the movie, and uh, uh, it's it's really fun to see him. You know, it, he takes all these out of a plastic bag, and then he has to corral them like herding cats back into the bag, and it's a pretty. <laughs> It's a pretty good shot. They they have yeah. fun up there occasionally. occasionally. Yeah, I'm sure they do. And the next one, I forget what it is, number seven. Uh, oh, here, this is very interesting. Tell tell us about okay. this. <laughs> well, uh, you can see the IMAX, uh, uh, one of the IMAX cameras off to the left, but uh, that's uh, that's Butch. That's uh, Butch Wilmore hanging out. Uh, and there's a few uh, uh, still cameras on the wall there next to him. Uh I thought They're that was amazing, looking at this picture and all those still cameras <laughs> with those huge lenses. Yeah, they uh, that those are left over from uh, uh, the shuttle days. They had to do, uh, after the Columbia accident, they did uh, shuttle tile inspections uh, from the station as, as the uh, uh, shuttle approach station. So they used those lenses to be able to get in and get tight on the shuttle to see if there's any tile damage. Uh, so that's what they are there for. And then uh, they've always they've always had a lot of uh, still cameras on board. And uh, it's great. Uh, my friend Marsha Ivins was one of the ones, an astronaut, and she pushed to get a digital system onto uh, space stations so they could continually downlink their images that they shot. And um, uh, it was because of her that they have uh, uh, all this digital imaging uh, capability on board now and uh so she's uh she's responsible for most of that mess <laughs> <laughs> okay the next few pictures are actually the c500 the the camera right. that you used um in in the space station so tell us what we're looking at here this this is butch and he's this is the first day that that they got the camera out of the bag uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he pulled it out, put it together and sent this picture down of, you know, smiling. I've got the toy out. Let's go to work. And, uh, <laughs> uh, he was, he was ready to, to get going. He, uh, he did a few shots that I think you wrote, uh, Academy Award acceptance speeches for, um, so he, <laughs> he was real proud of some of the things he shot as well. He should be. And, yeah, uh, sure. I, I, it's I'm love, amazed. I love having these guys, you know, they're, I'm they're amazed great. that they had enough time. The well, you know, who I'm sure they're every, every moment of their day is planned. I'm, I'm surprised they had enough time to do this. You're absolutely correct. Every moment of their day is planned. And when when we started this out, the, the people that, that dole out the, the minutes and seconds said, you're never going to get enough time to shoot your movie. Uh, we'll give you, you know, 20 hours over an increment and an increment was like four months. So like 20 hours of filmmaking over four months, that's not much, but these guys would grab the camera in their off days, their off times and shoot this stuff. They, it, they, they did it on their own time. And mm. uh, that shows you how dedicated they were to the film. Yeah. No it, kidding. So in other words, the astronauts all have, you know, some of their time is, categorized or identified as off time where they're they have time to themselves yep they i think they have a 12 or 14 hour work day and then <clears throat> excuse me then they uh you know they have time off at the end of the day the beginning of the day but they also get saturdays or sundays or mondays off depending on on how the schedule flows yeah you know. they get something yeah. of a weekend anyway <laughs> uh, let's go on to the next picture here of, of cameras on the iss uh, I, this is one of our other operators. This is Terry Verts. Uh, Terry was our number two operator. It, it came along in as second in line, uh, did a, a lot of the, a lot of the shooting. Uh, and again, he's got the C 500 there. Um, I don't know if we have any of the, of the other camera we had, we shot with a, uh, uh, let's this, I get all, all my astronauts in here. This is Chell Lindgren. Um, uh, he, he, he batted cleanup for us. All the easy stuff had been shot. Uh, Chell was our last guy up there and he had all the hard stuff, <laughs> but he got it all. <laughs> I see he's wearing a pair of Bose, Bose headphones as well. Yeah, yeah. A pair of Bose headphones on. They, they, they fly their own, uh, uh, you know, music so they can have, uh, you know, their own personal music. So if they have uh, headphones on, they can cut out. It's very noisy on space station. Lots of fans, you know, circulating the air, uh, experiments, you know, have to keep cool. Uh, you don't have convection cooling in space. Uh, so heat doesn't rise. You have to blow it away from the, uh, right, from whatever right. your piece of hardware. So there's lots of fans on things. So it's very noisy. So, uh, the noise canceling headsets come in to make your listening pleasure, uh, more enjoyable. Sure. And, uh, 
Well, I guess it, it sort of doesn't matter for the film because you're probably not using any of the audio, much of it anyway, from the space station. Well, for the interior scenes, we did. We used a lot of a lot of the audio that was recorded live as they shot, and and excuse me, you get a lot of of uh, candid comments. I mean, with 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 film running through the camera at three, at a thousand feet every three minutes, you didn't have the the luxury to um, uh, do interviews, man on the street interviews, or just stick the camera in the guy's face and say, "What are you doing?" Uh, with digital, we were able to do that, and we were able to run, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes at a time and just let, let these guys be themselves in front of the camera rather than having, a, you know, the 90-pound the giant going like a gangbusters over their shoulder running film through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was that is, was one of the other big advantages of shooting film for this. this, this uh, digital, you mean? So yeah, or shooting digital for this particular film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving on to the next picture, I think I have a series of pictures here uh, showing the camera kind of affixed to one of the portholes right, or windows. Right. This, this is the cupola. It's a seven-window observation port uh, that looks out on the Earth, uh, six windows around the circumference, and then the window that you can't see where the camera is uh, is a big circular round you know, uh, port uh, they can shoot from. Uh, so they were able to shoot, you know, targets coming at them, targets going away, and then targets as they pass right straight under them. The uh, the round, the window seven, the round one looks right straight down on the planet. So a lot of the stuff where we're looking right straight on the planet is shot from that window. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got bogan arms. They just clap clamp the thing onto uh, onto uh, a hand grip somewhere with a bogan arm, and uh, that's all you need. And, and I also start, noticed that you've got a cowl around the lens. Yeah, we uh, have so a, that there's uh, no no ambient light can get in from the yeah, side. Absolutely, we have shrouds. We custom built these shrouds uh, for the windows so that we wouldn't get any reflections. Uh, you know, the crew members operating the camera or lights in the background or anything like that. So that was very important. The other thing we built uh, was a bump shield. Uh, we what what these windows have on them. You can see the little orange tabs on all the windows there uh that's part of what's called a scratch pane uh nasa built all these beautiful perfectly optically clear windows for this 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 facility but then they put 25 cents worth of plastic on each one of them to protect them <laughs> uh which is not optically friendly and they're called scratch panes and that's what they do is they get scratched and mm. and they get nose prints you know from astronauts sticking their nose up against the window <laughs> I sure would be uh, doing that if I were. So there. It, it was they were kind of nasty to shoot through. So we we managed to to again. Marsha Ivans went to the uh, uh, all the powers that be at the Johnson Space Center and says we we want to pull these scratch panes off and we want to replace them with something that w we can work with that we can shoot through. And uh, we came up with this bump shield, which was basically a big piece of plexiglass. It was, wasn't really plexiglass. It's something space rated, cool. Uh, that that had little windows in it, and you could you could set your shot up with with uh, uh, you know through the plexiglass, and then you slide the little uh, French door window things open, and you shoot through uh, through that opening through the uh, the beautiful optical glass that's all nice and clean, and then when you're done, you close them back up to protect it, and uh, uh, you get much nicer images. And so the mm -hmm. astronauts like those so much. We we built two of them. We left them on board for them. And they're <laughs> cool. They're down. Here's another shot. Here's another shot of the camera right. from an angle, and and through the one of the side windows, you can see the Soyuz. See the uh, Soyuz out there docked. Yep, yep. You can read Russian. I can tell. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I happen to know what it looks like. So, um, but anyway, it's it's just fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and what the, what we did with the, with this this film, and we haven't seen any pictures of this camera yet, is we flew a, uh, the one DC which is a still camera. And because it is a, a larger full frame sensor, you know, it's the size of a, of a standard 35 millimeter still camera sense, uh, frame. Mm -hmm. uh, we shot uh, what amounted to hyperlapse of the earth going by at four frames a second and, and brought those images down and then interpolated the in-between images uh, and created 24 frame per second out of the four frame per second original material. It mm. gave us a more uh, 
IMAX friendly aspect ratio, uh, closer to the one four three aspect ratio. So that's the full screen images we get, and it being uh, a five K by by three and a half K image, it gave us more resolution, uh, which is what we really need for the distant shots for for that fine detail in the Earth that we wanted to pick up. So all the all the images of the Earth are shots with still images uh, at four frames a second. Ah, so. That's, this that's was kind a, of a, a real geeky thing. <laughs> hey, man, we're all geeks on this bus. I got to tell right. you that for sure. Um, okay, well, listen, we got much more to talk about. But before we do, I would like to thank our other sponsor for this episode, uh, which is Grasshopper, a new sponsor for Home Theater Geeks. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but it requires no hardware purchase or software installation. With their iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. When you make a call, your clients will see the uh, Grasshopper caller ID instead of your iPhones. Simply select a toll-free or local number, record a custom greeting, and add multiple extensions for your business. Toll-free numbers are great for marketing and make your business sound more professional. Setup department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. Get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. That's pretty cool. You can also send and receive SMS text messages from your business number. Join over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today with plans that start at just $12 a month. And you get a 30-day money-back guarantee. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save 50 bucks on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we thank Grasshopper very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. So we're floating around in space today and... Uh, Love to the, the next set of pictures that I have here are uh, actual images from the movie, or at least taken by these cameras. Uh, before we get there, though, I did have one question for you, which is the you mentioned the C one D, is it? What DC on Canon one oh, yeah. DC one DC, which is a still camera. Still uh, camera. The C the C five hundred isn't that essentially a DSLR as well? It's well, it's their foray into the cinema world from, you know, Canon's the people who started this whole HDSLR digital cinema uh, with, uh, with, the H with the SLR cameras, with the 5D years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it sort of blew up after they inter in introduced that camera. Uh, and they, they decided to jump into the, into the uh, cinema market, and the C300 was their first camera, the C500 was their second the c100 was was the third i think um and now they've got a new c700 that's just been announced this last week or so um and it was it was it was based off the technology of of that 5d that that they they pushed into into the the cinema products with the uh with their eos system um and and created those c300 c500 and they are that way. They're they are uh, HDSLR uh, cameras, but they're not. They're they're real hard working digital cameras, digital cinema cameras. C cinema cameras, yeah. Cinema cameras, yeah. And the C five, the, the new C seven hundred is is really a uh, uh, a beastie of a camera. It's uh, it's got a lot of a lot of things that these other cameras don't have, uh, and their uh, new new color technologies and and uh, is going to look really good. I wish they would have had one of those for space. Mm. Well, the next one you do. Next one. Next one we do. Yeah. 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 Well, let's take a look at some views that you actually captured with these cameras, or the astronauts, I should say, captured with these cameras. Um, well, this this is uh, this is one of the ones I was talking to. We finally were able to get these sort of shots uh, from space. Uh, this is actually London and the English Channel, and uh, uh, England, of course, and France off to the right side underneath the solar panel. Uh, you see the atmosphere, the green band of the of the oxygen layer, uh, uh, ionized oxygen particles, and and then the green of the of the aurora. Uh, mm. That's the northern northern lights. Um, 
this is stuff we've never been able to get. It's just because of, of the high sensitivity of these of these sensors, of the digital, the Canon digital sensors, and uh, uh, the, the the amazing low light capability they have. This is the whole eastern coast of the U.S. Uh, it's the whole eastern side of the U.S. Uh, from Chicago on the left hand side at the bottom of Lake Michigan, all the way over to New York, Long Island, Boston. Uh, you know, the Great Lakes, Toronto's sort of in the middle. Uh, you know, that's that's a geography uh, lesson of, of the yeah. east coast of the U.S. at night, plus the uh, stars and, and aurora. And you see seeing. the aurora there. I think the next one yeah. is really this an is, amazing. This is, this is one of the images that Butch wrote his Academy Award speech for. <laughs> <laughs> he was and like, I can, And I can like, understand why. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I think the uh, next this, one is is more of a real aurora, amazing aurora picture. There it is. Well, yeah, th these are all real aurora. This is the aurora australis. This is the southern lights. Mm. Uh, it's more. It seems to be more active than the northern lights. Uh, they fly through them basically. Uh, this is one of the from one of the last scenes in the film. Uh, but yeah, the whole color range that you see in this image uh, had not really. It took a lot of post processing previously. Uh, to pick all these colors out. Uh, but with the Canon sensors, uh, we were amazed that we got these without a whole lot of e effort. Uh, this is pretty much the way it came out of the camera. And hmm. uh, wow. uh, the, what, the, what the time of year was this? Was this were, were these shots taken? Um, you know, I, the, uh, the Southern Aurora was in their winter. So that was like last summer. Hmm. Uh, okay. So the, the Southern Pole, the South Pole was... <clears throat> Basically, as far away, pointed away from the sun. Right, from the sun. Yeah, yeah. I kind of would have thought uh, that it would have been the other way around. If it was a big aurora, that well, the you know, pole would you, be closer to the sun. Right. The more the it's it's the our mag our magnetosphere uh, uh, makes the 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 solar particles and it, it attracts them and makes them bends them around the Earth. I can't come mm -hmm. up with the the word I want, but it, it channels them. There we go. It channels them yeah, around, yeah, yeah. around the, around the planet. It's what protects us from, from all this, this deadly radiation, um, that comes from the sun. So whenever there's so high solar activity, we get the, uh, the Aurora and it's just a, a, uh, visual, uh, indicator of that. We have a good active magnetosphere up there. Which is a very good thing, because without it, we very would not thing. survive. Yeah. It's a very good thing, because without that, all of our geekness would go away. <laughs> go away, very quickly. Uh, let's yeah. take a look at a couple other photos here. This, um, uh, it, it, if we can back up. Uh, okay. One. Yeah, that one, is, that, my house is in that. That's a shot of my house. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, Dad, this is Florida. It's Miami. I'm up kind of on the bottom right corner of the frame. But anyway, wow. this is this is taken. This is a nighttime shot uh, under the full moon uh, of the Bahamas. And you can see the white sands of the reef at night, uh, which was totally amazed us. And Cuba's off on the right hand side and uh, you can see the keys trailing off there. So that's that's kind of an amazing image when you think about it. It is, man. Look at the at the amount of light in Miami. I mean, I assume that that yeah, big that's bright my, thing yeah. near the bottom is Miami, near your house. That's Miami. Yep, yep. That's Miami. Uh, so wow. Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Boca, West Palm, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Beat Beatmaster in the chat room is asking: Does the ever growing amount of LEDs for city lights, you know, street lights and so on, does that have any impact on what you're doing? Uh, no, it really doesn't. It's, uh, you know, the, it's, uh, unfortunately it's adding another wavelength of light that, that, uh, earth-based astronomers have to filter out of their, uh, visual images. Um, so, uh, if we could all decide on a single bandwidth to use for our street lights, uh, of color, you know, uh, it would make their job so much easier. Um, uh, but, uh, no, it, it's really not, a, uh, the LEDs are not really that, uh, uh, have an effect uh, on us at all that way. It yeah. just adds another yeah. color band in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Terry Kay is asking, are these still photos available anywhere? You sent them to uh, me, and I don't know <laughs> if I can if I can make them available uh, to people. These these are stills. <clears throat> these are the press stills from the um, uh, from the press release for the film. I don't think they're available to the general public. They are out there on the web if you, uh, you know, search a beautiful planet around, I'm sure you will find them on the web because they have been released as uh, press images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's take a so look at a couple other. Don't go out and sell them, or you'll have IMAX. Oh on your no. Butt, for sure. no, 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 no. <laughs> Believe me, I'll I'll be cool, man. <laughs> Well, let's take another look at a couple of images here. Here's a daytime shot. I don't know where this, this is, is. This is your house. Oh, uh, Southern California. Huh? Southern California. Uh, you can see the Salton Sea, uh, Point Conception, the Channel Islands, Catalina. You can see all the oh, Channel Loquacious. Islands. Oh, Loquacious. Loquacious's home is on this shot then because she lives there's, on Catalina Island. Well, there you go. There's Catalina, all, you know, center, lower third. Um mm -hmm. Uh, you can see uh, Long Beach Harbor there. You can see Sa San Diego, uh, Mission Bay, Tijuana, uh, all the way over to the Great, uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, Lake Powell, uh, Lake Mead. All that is there all the way up to – you can barely see over on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a little bit of Morro Bay there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that little bit of blue that's sticking out there, that's Morro Bay. Uh, you can see Lake Tahoe, the Sierra, uh, the entire Central Valley. Um, you know, death, the whole, the whole shoot matches there. There's like four states, five states there, count, not counting <laughs> Mexico. Amazing. So, Creamy Corn Cob in the chat room is asking, what is the uncompressed resolution of these photos? The uncompressed and of, resolution. And of the movie. Uh, well, the movie is shown in 4K. Uh, everything that, you know, that we, we put out is in 4K. Um, the still images were, uh, uh, well, there's this, the, the, the raw images out of the 1DC were 5.2K, I think, wide. Uh, so it's, it's basically 5.2 by 3.2, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, the exact numbers. Yeah, yeah, that, that gives us an idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next image uh, that we want to take a look at here coming up is, oh, man, a yeah. giant hurricane. Yeah, there's people not having a good day down there. Uh, that, <laughs> no kidding. That is tropical typhoon Mysac. Uh, it was it's not over even the a hurricane. It's well, it's it's it is, but it's a typhoon. It's it's in the wrong. Oh, it's it's because it's, it's in the southern hemisphere. They call it a it's typhoon. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's in the northern hemisphere, but they just call them typhoons on that side of the world. Oh, uh, okay. Maybe it's the eastern hemisphere as opposed yeah, to the west. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Um, uh, whatever. It's it was a Category Five storm, and that the eye that you see there is twenty five miles across. Wow. Uh, so it's a big, it's a big storm. It was over the island of Yap, I think, when this was shot. Mm -hmm. So it was over in that part of the, the Pacific. Um, and Dr. Right. Morbius in the chat room says, Western Pacific, they are called well, there, typhoons. There we go. Okay. Eastern uh, Pacific, knew, it's it's hurricanes. Hurricanes. Okay. Yeah. I guess when they cross the international date line, they change. I don't know. That may be. That may be. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, the weather phenomenon that that you get from space is just amazing sometimes, uh, and and the hurricanes obviously are the are the most fun to look at. Uh, uh, for Blue Planet, years ago, we uh, every time our our writer director Tony Myers wrote something in the script, somehow it always happened. Uh, we she wrote in a, a hurricane, and we ended up shooting uh, Hurricane Hugo when it hit Charleston, and she wrote in a type uh, a earthquake, and the big uh, Loma Peru. Prieta earthquake in, oh, in yeah. Sa San Francisco hit. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. whatever you do, don't write in nuclear war. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that to happen. Yeah, no, no Quit writing. Um, I think there's a couple pictures also of some stuff happening in space. Here's a spacewalk. That's cool. This, this is Terry Verts out on a spacewalk. This was actually shot uh, with a GoPro, with a 4K GoPro. If you no look kidding. In, wow. If you look, it's, it's a space selfie. Um, and if you look out there in the reflection, <laughs> uh, the reflection in his helmet, you can see the little GoPro that he's holding out. Uh, yeah, zoom right in there. That's the GoPro and, and it's a little wow. space. Um, so, uh, that's, that's how he got that. We, uh, I think he did like five seconds of that then stuck it back on his, uh, his, uh, space suit and went about his work. Uh, they're not out there to take pictures. They're out there to do business. So, uh, there's no not kidding. a lot of, of good. Of, of the whole, <clears throat> the whole sequence in the film uh, was made up of probably you know five ten second clips that we found usable uh, because they're just, they're moving around and and doing stuff and they're not paying attention to this little GoPro strapped to their chest. Mm -hmm. uh, but occasionally he Terry said I I just hold still for a few seconds so that you could get something and then he went on and did and did things so did his work yeah um, <laughs> copy three eighty six in the chat room he's he's coining a new term for a space selfie. He's calling it a spelfie. 
<laughs> well, we we built the first selfie stick for space, uh, uh, and and I don't know if we can go all the way that back, but one of the this, I think the very second image we looked at had the had the selfie stick sticking out in front of the C five hundred, so they can mm. there we go you can see it there between Scott and I that that black it's a Berkey rod uh, that's attached to the front of the camera they could just hold onto the onto the selfie stick and and do selfies. Uh, we got three or four good selfies out of it, but we didn't end up using them. So mm. in the film. Okay. Maybe All right. Next, next, next movie. <laughs> next movie. Yeah. And then one last shot I think I have, I, I sent up there was uh, of the Soyuz uh, either coming in for a landing or for a I, docking or I, departing. I don't know which. Yep. That's, that's, uh, that's how the, the guys get up there. Now uh, we launch from uh, Baikonur uh, Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and uh, on board a, uh, a Soyuz, and this is, uh, uh, I think, I, I forget which crew this is coming up. It may have been uh, Terry and, and Samantha, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something. We, uh, uh, on one of the launches, one of these solar panels that you see didn't deploy all the way, or didn't deploy Ooh. at all, and we were filming as it came in to dock, and as they docked, it popped out, so we <laughs> ended up... Uh, giving them a copy of our footage so they could analyze, uh, you know, what was happening, what was going on. So several went times, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Several times during our, you know, we've, we've been doing this since 1984. Uh, this is our seventh movie in space. Um, several times during that time we have, we have, we've worked with NASA and given them our footage just so they could get look at anomalies, uh, that happened on orbit. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of cool to be able to contribute to the space program that way. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, and, the movies, uh, sorry, go ahead. One of, the, one of the cool things is everybody asks me, well, how do you direct a film in space? Well, we give them a shot list, uh, you know, to work from, but we also uh, can, we're, we're able to send emails back and forth. You know, we couldn't send an email and say, shoot this, but they could email us and say, well, what do you think if we shot that? Uh, but they also have the world's best telephone system on board. Um, huh. they can call anywhere in the world for free and nobody can call them. So <laughs> a, a, occasionally wow, so they won't get I, interrupted by anybody. My phone would, would have, uh, uh, you know, space station on the caller ID. <laughs> oh man, really? Oh, that yeah, is so and, awesome. And like, okay, honey, I got to take this call. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So that's, uh, that's I was wondering my, if you could send texts okay. back and forth. Does it have to be email or can, can uh, I mean, I found text to be very useful to communicate we, with people. We, no, we don't. It, it doesn't support SMS texts, but mm -hmm. uh, I text a lot with the, uh, with the astronauts when they're on the ground, uh, you know, during training or afterwards, we're, we're, we become pretty good friends with the crew. So, uh, Oh yeah, man. Oh, man. Marsha is actually in Australia right now doing the opening in, uh, in Sydney and Melbourne of the movie. So, uh, She's she's got that fun job. By the way, we should mention that the the movie A Beautiful Planet uh, is uh, narrated by Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so uh, we really so, uh, really uh, were fortunate to get get her. I think it brought a whole new. She brought a whole new uh, uh, demographic to the to uh, the film that wouldn't have been there before. So, uh, and we're we're fortunate. We've been in. Uh, I think we've just fallen out of the top 30 grocers on, on weekend box office um, just this last week or so. We had been, you know, 25, 28. I think we fell to 32 or something like that. But mm -hmm. it's, it's a 46-minute film in 35 screens, and we're, we're, we're fighting it out with, you know, tentpole films from the, from the, uh, from the studios and, and mm. hanging in the top 30. So it's, it's been a pretty popular film. Yeah, pretty amazing. Beatmaster asked, do astronauts get an IMDB entry as director of photography? That's your job. <laughs> you know, uh, Chell came back and wanted to know if he could join the union. <laughs> <laughs> become an and ASC, said, a member of ASC. Said, if you if you want if you want to become a union member and pay dues every year, yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it would be kind of cool to to uh, and and the 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 precedent is there to put astronauts in as honorary members of the ASC. Uh, the Apollo 11 crew uh, were members. Uh, the two mm. surviving guys are still there. Uh, Buzz and, and uh, Michael Collins are still uh, honorary members. Uh, Bruce McCandless, who flew the Buck Rogers backpack that everybody saw um, uh, 
in gravity, you know, flying around. Right. Right. Uh, right. He's, he's a member, so yeah, I think I think we should should put some astronauts in as as uh, honorary members. I may have to bring that up to the board, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and you, as you said, this is your what seventh uh, movie this in is, space for IMAX. This is my seventh IMAX movie in space. It's um, and you know I've done about forty of these things so over the last forty years. So mm-hmm. uh, I like the, the the space stuff. It's fun. I uh, get to work with a lot really of fun, fun people. Yeah, yeah. Get to do cool stuff. So, uh, any plan? What are the plans for the future? Got got more space coming up, or other projects? Uh, I'm sure you're working on a bunch of stuff. Well, of course, I'd like I'd like to I'd like to keep working in the space program and in, in in making movies, whether it's in IMAX or or virtual reality. I think virtual reality in space would be really cool. Um, oh man, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, I, I'm working on something that I can't really talk about right now regarding mm. that. So um, okay. Maybe maybe next have, time I talk to you, I can t- I can tell you more about it. <laughs> okay, well I definitely want to have you back to talk about that and anything <laughs> else you're working on. Uh, did you happen to watch in watch any of the Olympic uh, footage in virtual reality? I uh, I have not. I've not seen. I saw there was some available. I've just not had the chance to uh, put put a headset on and have a look at them. But uh, yeah, I, yeah. One of the problems, of course, is that the resolution is pretty low. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's one that's thing my, that we would want to see in the future. Higher that's resolution. Been my, my issue with 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 VR so far is is you know I'm used to watching big crisp clear images and and uh, the the display technology is not quite you know where it should be I think but uh, it's getting there and I think that you add the immersiveness of some sort of physical interaction there and and you really transport people uh, to where to where you're shooting um, we had a demo at the ASC where we uh, they just put a, a I don't know it was a, a a line, a rope, or something on on the floor, and we were on a tightrope in virtual reality. And, oh. and when, when you put your foot on that that rope on the floor, even though you know you were standing on the floor, you were instantly on that tightrope. And it was like, okay, I can't do this. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm not walking dizzy, out there. nauseous. Uh, not nauseous, scared. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fall, all right. I can dig I can it. Totally. I'm gonna fall off this eighth inch rope. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it wouldn't hurt at all because you're it's on the floor. <laughs> but the brain is an amazing thing. It doesn't take much for the brain and in virtual reality to to believe you're actually doing that. And, and what is it? Six Flags uh, Magic Mountain has the virtual roller coaster ride, and and I think that would be interested in in a lot of these motion based rides now is just to convert them to uh, to VR and and put that rock and roll, you know, uh, input, you know, physical tactile input in with the yeah. in, in virtual re- world. I got to tell you that that one ain't for me because I don't <laughs> ride roller coasters as it is. And adding the extra dimension of, of the virtual reality, I'm sure I would lose my lunch. No doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, we've come to the end of a really fascinating hour and I want to thank you so much for being here uh, to show us what you've been doing in space. Space. <laughs> The space cadet I am. There we go. The space cadet you are, and I am too. I will admit it fully. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, when you've got uh, another project under your belt uh, of this sort or something else, uh, maybe something in the VR realm, whatever, whenever you're ready, uh, I would love to have you come back and talk about that. I'd love to do that, Scott. Anytime. Anytime hey, at all. Thank you so much. Uh, that's, James, that's James Nyhouse, uh, ASC. Uh, he's a cinematographer who was in charge of training the astronauts for shooting A Beautiful Planet and six other movies for IMAX up in space. Really fun to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> now, uh, you can learn more about uh, James at his website, jamesnyhouseasc.com. You can always find me at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott and at AVS Forum. Uh, you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash HTG and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Also on iTunes and various other places. So uh, easy to find and I hope you will. Next week, my guest geek will be Marshall Long. He's an acoustician 
And we're going to talk about room acoustics, uh, a subject near and dear to my heart and one we've talked about on this show before. Uh, but uh, Marshall is uh, more experienced in larger rooms. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the difference between that and smaller rooms and a bunch of other cool stuff. So I do hope you will join us for that. Now, that show is pre-recording tomorrow, September 9th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and it'll be aired at the normal Home Theater Geeks time on next Thursday, where when I will be at the Cedia trade show. So I won't be able to do the show then. I'm pre-recording it tomorrow. So I hope you show up and uh, come into the chat room and uh, hang with me and Marshall Long. Until then, geek out. Mm -hmm.